Okay, well, during these trying times, our men's club at B'nai Asher in Cleveland has really stepped up to the plate. You saw a sample of the programs that they have done under the leadership of the president, Jerry Brodsky, and the program director, Mitch Lauer. They have risen to the occasion with, great, with a great Zoom experience. And this is not just for the men's club, but for our synagogue and the community as a whole. So Yasher Koach to my friends. I am Murray J. Berkowitz, and almost 40 years ago, when I was men's club president, we had a dinner planned and the caterer who was supplying the food reneged. So we decided, what the heck, we're gonna cook it ourselves. So after calls every 10 minutes to my wife, uh, we did it. And uh, that's how my cooking career kind of started. So I started making dinners for men's club meetings. Then I graduated to congregational Shabbat luncheons. Soon I was making dinners for over 200 people at the shul. And I even uh, created a, a little cooking class for our adult education series. I found that I enjoyed cooking and the managing of the uh, catering business. All of our preparation from purchasing food to cooking and baking was done by, excuse me, by volunteers, both men and women. And we established in doing so great friendships and learned quite a bit from one another. Among our many talented volunteers, two stood out, Tova Cohn and Faith Eisenberg. Together, we three were recruited to run the kitchen at the synagogue. And we provided countless meals for Shabbat and special occasions or other times like cooking 800 chumintashen. When COVID-19 hit, we were asked to create some Zoom cooking culinary classes. Together with Tova Kohn, we did just that. We have produced 26 hour long classes in the last year. They have all been under the direction of Chad Cohn, who started as a Zoom novice and has become a Zoom master. His video introductions and coordination of our classes with his ingenuity, his creativity, and his very hard work and time is unsurpassed and we really wanna thank him. Tova Cohn is more than a partner in this endeavor. When I am, what I am is basically a novice uh, at this. She's the real deal. She is an accomplished and trained cook and chef. She adds so much to our presentations with her helpful tidbits and her culinary knowledge. Tonight, we focus on cooking for Passover. We try to stay away from Seder food per se and give you tonight's recipes that are part of uh, our, our past a little bit because we used to do some dinners during Chol HaMoed for the synagogue. So without any ado, I turn it over to my partner, Tova. Thank you, Murray. Um, I, I just want to reiterate that um, when Passover comes, we enjoy eating the different foods, some of which we only eat during this holiday. But it's also nice to have foods that take us out of our usual Passover repertoire. So the food preparations that we're sharing tonight will add, hopefully, some pizzazz to your Pesach. We're going to begin with cream of asparagus soup. Asparagus is pictured on ancient Egyptian friezes. The first shoots of asparagus appear in the spring. Also in this soup are leeks, the mildest of the allium family that includes onion, garlic, scallions, shallots, and chives. Dried specimens of leek were found in archeological sites in Egypt. Leeks also appeared on wall carvings and drawings indicating the leek was a part of the Egyptian diet. In Torah, in Numbers 11.5, leeks are mentioned as one of the foods greatly missed by the Israelites after they left Egypt. 
This soup is certainly fitting for Pesach. Okay, Chad, roll it. <laughs> We're gonna make the cream of asparagus soup and I just wanna show you a couple of things first. With the asparagus, asparagus has a natural breaking point and you can just snap off the ends. You don't really need to cut them. Okay, and then we're gonna cut the tips off and save those because they don't go in at the same time as the stalks. And then we're just gonna cut this into smaller segments, about, about a half inch. Okay. And of course, the part you snap off, you just toss. I'm gonna show you how to clean a leek and get it ready for dicing. So we're gonna cut the end off. Um, there's usually roots there. And you're gonna cut the dark green part off. The light green part is fine. You wanna keep that. Then we're going to peel off the one outer layer and you're going to make a, an X on the top of the leek. And we're going to peel these back because sometimes there's grit in there. But it's only at that top part. So you're going to just rinse it. I pat it dry a little bit. And then it's very easy to dice. You just continue the cuts you've already made. And don't forget this soup is gonna get pureed, so it's no big deal the sizes. So we're just gonna go down the stalk where we've cut into it. And now I'm gonna cut into it again. Because it has this root here, it holds it together, makes it nice and easy. And we're just going to continue cutting it until we've diced all of it. Um, I've got my four quart pot and there's a little bit of vegetable oil heating in here. Uh, I still use safflower oil during Pesach. There is kosher le Pesach safflower oil. And we're going to add our diced onion. and our leeks right from the cutting board. And we're going to cook these for about five to seven minutes until they they soften and get translucent. We don't want to brown them really. Our leeks and onion are nice and soft and translucent. So now we're going to add our um, either chicken stock or vegetable stock or hard chicken stock, which is what this is. And we're going to add our potato, diced potato, one medium, a little bit of nutmeg. This is optional, you can leave it out. And then we're going to add our oregano again. You're going to take it between your fingers to release the oils and flavor as you add it to your soup. And we're going to bring this to a boil. So I'm going to turn my heat up a little bit and we're going to bring it to a boil. One of the nice things about having time in between uh, the different steps of making the soup is it gives you a chance to clean as you go so that you don't have a big mess waiting for you at the end. Um, this is a big part of cooking. Uh, the soup has come to a boil so now I'm going to add the asparagus stalks not the tips. We are still reserving the tips. Give it a little stir and I'm going to put my lid on. I'm going to turn the heat down to low and I'm going to let this simmer for about 35 to 40 minutes uh, until the asparagus stalks are tender. The soup's been cooking for 35 minutes. And if I press one of the stalks against the side with a spoon, I don't know if you can see, but you can see it, it's mushes, so we know they're cooked. The asparagus is cooked. So I'm gonna turn my soup off 
and I'm gonna puree it. I like doing this with an immersion blender as opposed to doing it in batches in a blender. So you'll see how easy this is. <laughs> It's done. Um, this is one of the best tools of, in the kitchen. And you just have to remember, don't lift it up above the uh, level of the liquid because it will go everywhere. If you just keep it immer immersed and uh, run it, everything will get pureed evenly and you don't have to do it in batches. So this is a real time saver. going to add the rest of our ingredients to the pureed soup. So um, we've got cream. You can either use cream and make your soup dairy or use um, non-dairy creamer for part. You never want to add cold cream into a hot soup because it will curdle. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of hot soup into the cream and stir it. It's going to temper it enough so that when we do add it to the soup, it's going to be just fine. Nice and smooth. Okay, so now we're going to add the cream. And we're going to add lemon juice. I like lemon juice, so this is two tablespoons. We're going to add salt and pepper and a little bit of cooking sherry. This is uh, kosher for Pesach cooking sherry wine. Okay, we're going to bring this uh, back to a simmer. Just stir it all to combine the ingredients. Now finally, we're going to add our asparagus tips. So we're just going to cook it until they're not raw anymore, but they don't need a long cooking time, about 10 minutes. And um, stir it in there. So we're going to let that simmer for 10 minutes. The soup is done simmering. And uh, I'm going to put it in a bowl and show you that you get a little bonus. Oh, there's something that didn't get pureed, but that's okay. You get a little bonus of the um, tops of the asparagus in the soup. Now, you'll taste your soup and adjust the seasonings. Um, I have found sometimes, even if it tastes like it needs a little more salt, if you add a little more lemon juice, it won't need any more salt. So just taste it according to your taste and then add maybe a little more lemon juice or salt and pepper as you need to. Okay, Chad, you want to read the question? I can't hear you, you might be muted. Um, let me see if there are questions in the chat. Um, I think somebody asked about using broccoli or cauliflower. I've never done it with anything but asparagus. And so I don't know if the flavors complement or if you would use slightly different ingredients for the soup. So I would just Google cauliflower soup for Passover. I'm sure you'll find recipes. Anything else? I don't see any other question. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, if anybody has a question, they can unmute themselves and just uh, ask it. All right, maybe we just move on. Move on. Okay. All right, so the next thing we're gonna make um, is smashed potato. The first time I ate smashed potato was years ago when a fellow congregant and friend, Bonnie Potash made them. They are a favorite, and I promise you, if you make them, 
you will not have any leftovers. So this is smashed potatoes. Um, I've got these red potatoes, baby red potatoes. I don't even know if they're called baby. But anyways, um, I buy the smallest ones I can find. I like to steam my potatoes. If you want to boil them, you can boil them. I've got my steamer in my pot here, and I'm just going to add uh, these clean scrubbed red potatoes all around. And I'm going to steam them for about, once it boils, it's going to take about 15 minutes. I'm going to cover it. So the potatoes have been steaming. It's been about 15 minutes. I'm going to take my cake tester and um, test them, and they're, they're perfect. Um, you, you want them so that they're, when the cake tester goes in, it goes in easily, okay? I'm going to take this steamer out carefully, and I'm going to put it on the counter, and we're just going to let the potatoes cool. So the potatoes have cooled. They're still warm, but it's easier to handle them. So we're going to start smashing. This is the fun part. So we take our first potato, and I've got my parchment lined cooking sheet here, and I put it on the cooking sheet, and just like that, I'm smashing it. I'm going to do it with all the potatoes. If I wasn't ready to put them in the oven, because uh, I had done this earlier in the day, then I would just take a cotton towel and just wrap it around the baking sheet and I would leave it on the counter to sit like this until I am ready to put it, you know, to prepare it to put in the oven, okay? But we are ready to put it in the oven, so now, comes the next step. I'm going to oil the bottom and the top of each potato with a little bit of olive oil. I'm going to sprinkle a little kosher salt on it and put it in the oven at 425 degrees. Uh, we're going to let it roast for about 20 minutes and then we're going to flip them. And the potatoes have been in the oven for about 25-30 minutes, so I'm going to flip them. And don't be concerned if they're apart like that, they're, they're going to be just delicious. They don't always hold together. I'm going to just dab just a little bit of olive oil on each one of these just to give it a little more sizzle. And back in the oven. Leave these in here for about 20 minutes and we'll check them. Okay, so it's been another 20 minutes and here's the smashed potatoes. They're golden and sizzling and delicious. So this is how I do it. Right into the serving dish. Mashed potatoes. Okay. Back right. to you, Murray. Okay. Well, that was great, uh, Tova. I really learned a lot as usual. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if anybody can name, you know, Chad puts this music behind things. If anybody can name all the uh, tunes, then after COVID, uh, Tova and I will come to your house and make you dinner. 
So the first person who does it, let us know. Okay, so we're going to move on to these potato chips. Now, this is what the only uh, thing that uh, we've repeated in all our cooking classes. Uh, how many recipes? I don't know. Probably uh, over a hundred recipes. But I did it just because uh, I, I thought that I might have invented this. Because 30 years ago, I came up with these microwave potato chips. Now, since I've gone on the uh, internet and everybody and their brother has them, but I really think I was the first one. And I don't think I was on the internet 30, 35 years ago. So anyway, so uh, let's uh, roll them, Chad. We are going to make some microwave homemade potato chips. To do so, we start out with two sheets of parchment paper. We lay them on top of each other, and we put them on top of the glass plate that is in the bottom of the microwave. We then cut the sheets to fit the plate. So just trim around the edges. Then once we cut both round pieces, we set them as one aside, put the other on the glass plate. Then I take out my one millimeter Cuisinart blade, or if you have a mandolin, you can use that. I put on a protective glove, and now I'm going to start slicing the potatoes. These are, of course, washed potatoes. I like using yellow potatoes because they don't brown as I set them out, and they seem to work a little better for me. So I just run this over the blade. And what I end up with are nice potato slices, thin slices that will become the potato chips. We lay them out on the paper like this. So this is how it looks when we get the tray totally full. We then spray a little bit of the non-stick spray on the top. And if you wish, you can use any kind of seasoning. I'm just putting a little bit of salt. This comes out very slowly in the salt shaker. Then we take this tray over to our microwave. I set my 1200 degree microwave on high for about five minutes. While that is cooking, I start slicing another potato for the second sheet. After I get seven or eight slices like this, I'll stop and lay them out on the sheet. And then I will continue till I fill up the entire sheet. Our five minutes have elapsed on our first batch in the microwave. And as you can see, the center chip is just starting to brown. The outside chips are not brown yet. So we're gonna let this go another 30 seconds and check it out. After another 30 seconds, you can see the center chip looks like it's pretty much done, but the others aren't. So I will take out this center chip, set it aside, and continue on with the rest. After another 30 seconds, they're just starting to brown, so we'll have to be kind of careful to watch them. We want them to turn out like this center chip. But uh, you have to be careful because they can burn very quickly at this point. So it may not take the full 30 seconds. So I'm going to turn it on and watch them carefully. So watching them carefully, I did let them go for the full 30 seconds. And this is how they look. They look pretty good to me. So we're going to take the entire plate out. Be careful because it'll be hot and put it aside for the moment. These are how our chips look 
out of just out of the microwave. We're going to slide those off. And we're going to take the other chips and let me get while there was, those were cooking and slide them on. Then we'll spray them and put them back in the microwave for five minutes. Then we're going to take these chips and place them in a bowl. They've been out here for a minute or two. They're nice and cool and starting to crisp up even more. Two stuck together, I just separated them. And then we have a nice little bowl of chips. In the meantime, the other ones are cooking. This parchment paper, I can use over again. It works just fine. In fact, it's a little stiffer, so it's a little easier to work with. And that's our homemade potato chips. <laughs> All right, I just want to show you this parchment paper has made 1,742 potato chips. So very economical and very, uh, you know, environmentally friendly. So we want to be always like that. Uh, I saw one question. I don't take the, I don't skin the potatoes. Uh, the skin is good for you. It's got all the vitamins and nutrients and, and you know, so I think that's okay. I don't, any other questions? There was a question too on, uh, uh, Aaron Altman wanted to know, uh, how do you estimate the quantity of ingredients to these dishes? I think that, I think maybe that was for Tova. Well, that's. You read the recipe. Recipe, yeah. recipes either in the chats or it was put out by the Federation. Or you could be clairvoyant. <laughs> All right, Tova, your turn. Okay. Well, Murray, you neglected to add the warning that those potato chips are addicting. They are that good. So is it Van Gogh or Van Gogh? Florence or Firenze? Jerusalem or Yerushalayim? Chicken Marbella or Chicken Marbella? <laughs> that name suggests a dish from Marbella, a resort city in southern coastal Spain. But actually, this dish was created on the Upper West Side of New York City by Sheila Lukens, the co-creator and then co-owner of the Silver Palette one of the first high-end prepared food shops. This recipe first appeared in the Silver Palette Cookbook published in 1979. This cookbook was a huge deal, replacing the joy of cooking for those of you that remember that cookbook. It has sold over 2.7 million copies. This dish is a natural for holiday and Shabbat dinners. The prep is done the day before or early morning the day of. So you can use the Spanish Upper West Side pronunciation Chicken Marbella or the never been to the Silver Palette or Coastal Spain, somewhat Italian pronunciation Chicken Marbella. Either way, you'll be talking about this all-time delicious crowd-pleasing dish. So we're going to start um, putting together the marinade for the chicken, for the chicken marbella. And I like to do it in a roaster pan that has a lid. You can do it in a baking, um, in a glass baking dish, and then cover it with foil, whatever your preference is. So um, I'm going to add my prunes. I like the prunes, so I use, I use about two cups. Olives. No pits, make sure they're pitted. You know, don't want anybody breaking a tooth. Uh, we're going to add capers. And uh, capers are flower buds from the caper bush, which grows all over the Mediterranean. And they're picked before they flower. Okay. 
uh, oregano and as we do with all our dried herbs we're gonna take it between our fingers and crumble it into the baking pan. Red wine vinegar is, is available for Passover. Olive oil. My minced garlic. Um, I really don't add very much salt, maybe just a pinch because the kosher chicken has plenty of salt in it. And um, I'm going to add a little bit of ground pepper, black pepper. So we're going to just sort of combine this a little bit. And we're going to add our chicken to it. I've got my chicken legs. You can use chicken legs, chicken breasts um, with the bone in. I also have included in the recipe if you just want to make it with boneless chicken breasts. Um, we're going to add these into the marinade and I, I have them in the bowl, the schissel in Yiddish, um, that my mother would put her cleaned chicken. Um, I cleaned the chicken first in boiling water always and um, I use the same bowl that my mother did. So we're going to add it to the marinade. And I just kind of get it in there so it gets the marinade on it. Okay. Kind of configure it so that they fit in nicely. Uh, they can overlap, but you don't want anything. You don't want two layers of it. Then I'm going to spoon some of the marinade on top. Okay, that's pretty good. We're going to cover this and put it in the refrigerator and let it marinate all day. You can even let it marinate overnight. I have my chicken marbella that's been marinating all day. And I've got my brown sugar and I'm going to sprinkle it over the top. So fruit and uh, meat is actually something that's been a part of the Persian cuisine for a long, long time. And a lot of Sephardi dishes combine those two and it's, it's absolutely delicious. And I've got my dry white wine. Any dry white wine will work. You don't want to use a sweet wine and you want to use the wine that you would drink. You know, not like a, a bad wine. <laughs> We're just going to pour the wine over the top of the chicken. It. Now I'm going to put the lid back on and this is going to go into the oven for one hour. Chicken's been in the oven for an hour. So I'm just going to take the lid off. And you can see the chicken's cooking but it looks a little anemic. So it's going to stay in there for another half hour without the lid and it will get nice and golden. So the chicken um, is ready. As you can see, it has a beautiful golden color uh, since it cooked for another half hour without the lid on. And I'm going to put it on a platter for serving. Okay, I'm gonna start with these. Um, this is the point where if you want to cut the leg and thigh apart, it's very easy to do. Okay, I'm going to leave the rest of them whole. And I'm going to spoon the sauce along with the prunes and the olives. All around the 
chicken. I like cilantro. If you don't, you can use parsley. And I'm using my kitchen shears to chop up the herb and not bruise it. And then I'm just gonna sprinkle cilantro on top of it. And this is how I'm gonna serve it. Chad, are there any questions? Well, let's see. There are some questions or comments. Um, do you keep the skin on? You do keep the skin on. The I serve it with the skin on and let each person make their own decision about the skin. Okay. All right. Uh, a suggestion from someone, Martin Paley, who's made this dish is he uses the chicken in eighths so that there it's easier to eat. Okay. And um, and the minion le leader wants to know what if you want to use wine. What if you want to use wine? Wine, yes. To it, it uses wine. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> if you don't want to use wine, maybe you can use like, you know, chicken stock. But you know, the alcohol cooks out, and it just creates a um, magnificent sauce. All right, Murray, back to you. Okay, well, I learned from this, uh, Tova, that you always got skin in the game, so <laughs> that's good. So uh, we're going to move on to the uh, something sweet, chocolate mousse, which is uh, just got to be careful if you don't want to eat raw eggs because it has raw eggs in it. But uh, it's something sweet and good, so uh, let's take it away, Chad. We are going to make Parv chocolate mousse, one of our Passover dessert favorites. We start by separating the eggs. There are many methods to separate the egg yolk from the egg white. One that I like to use is a little plastic bottle, which we push out the air. And then suck up the egg yolk and then we can deposit it, separate it, and then we take the egg white and put it in the bowl. We'll do this for four eggs in total. Then we take six ounces of chocolate chips, put them in a four quart microwave safe bowl, and put them in the microwave. We turn the power on. And hit it for about 30 seconds. It begins to melt. And then we will continue in the microwave for 30 second increments. To the melted chocolate, we add our four egg yolks that are beaten. Half of our quarter cup of sugar. Doesn't have to be exact. Our quarter cup of coffee. Is strong and many times during Passover we'll use instant coffee. Then we take our hand mixer and we mix this all together. Our egg whites, put them in the big bowl. And take our remaining sugar and put it in. Make sure your bowl and your egg whites are warm and not uh, 
at room temperature at least. Otherwise, it won't work too well. So you turn on your mixer at low or medium and start to beat them. This will incorporate air into them and make them nice and uh, fluffy. We'll revisit in a few minutes. So after several minutes of mixing, the egg whites become fluffy after incorporating all that air and they peak and they're ready to combine with the chocolate. We then take the egg whites and fold them into the chocolate. We get a nice chocolatey mixture, which will now refrigerate for four hours at least. After four hours, this is how it looks coming out of the refrigerator. To serve it, a lot of times you just take little cups because it's very light, but very rich. And we load them up. and serve it with a little spoon. And it's quite yummy and delicious. Goes well with fruit or with plain cake. Okay, uh, any questions? Anything you see, Chad? Uh, uh, no, I don't see any new questions. Uh, people were submitting the the names of the background. Right. Oh, my, my, well, first of all, I, I think they need it all for all the music, but I saw some kind of French lyric or name for the song. Actually, it's a little known variation of the song, Hang On Sloopy. And, uh, you know, Chad had rearranged it a little bit, so I'm sorry nobody won. <laughs> but uh, maybe after COVID, we'll, we'll, we'll make you a dinner anyway, someone, somewhere. Okay, so uh, that kind of concludes our cooking part. Uh, just uh, a few announcements. We're going to be continuing some Passover cooking on our synagogue website. Uh, we'll be doing this Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time and again uh, on the March 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, raw eggs in the mousse, yes, they're all raw, okay? If you cook them, it ain't going to be moose. <laughs> it may be. It'll be some other animal. Okay. Uh, and really, that's it. We're just so, so I, excited. I have a, I have a few yeah. questions for you, Murray. This is Danny. Yes. Um, so how long you, have you guys been doing this? We've been doing it for a year. We started right after Passover last year. Yeah. And, you know, uh, one of the rabbis mentioned something to me. And, of course, I had a rope in 
Tova, otherwise it would have been, you know, like a disaster. So, uh, you know, so we've been doing this and some, you know, we do it in spurts. So it's, it's worked out to 26 episodes and each episode is four, sometimes five uh, recipes. We started doing them live and then we decided pre-recording them where it's much better uh, because you could see start to finish and everything else. Although we did do some cook along ones that kind of worked out all right too. Yeah. And are you a cook professionally? Who, me? No, I'm, I'm a retired dentist. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I, you know. And Tova, are you a professional? I'm a professional family cook for my family. So no, nobody, you know, uh, we all love to cook. We all, uh, I speak for myself, I love to eat. And uh, if you want to eat, particularly during COVID, you got to cook. So I, we just kind of came together with, with similar likes and uh, we complement each other. You know, uh, one person carries the stress, one person, <laughs> Murray, which is usually Murray. And, uh, and then we just get together and, and make it work somehow. You know, and, and the best part of all this is that we try out when we cook, we try it out on each other. We, you know, drop it off to one another. So to yeah. say, you know, how it is and all that. So, you know, that's why I've gained uh, like uh, 12 pounds during COVID, but, uh, you know. COVID-19 you gained. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have another question. So this was very, very professionally done with a lot of editing and a lot of film. Now, who did all your videography did chat do that well yeah he does a lot i do i shoot my own and i have to shoot by myself because and that's how it is you know during this time so i shoot my own and i edit to certain you know my things and send it to chad and he mute puts the music in and and we work it together but he does a fantastic job of filming tova and yeah. editing it and putting in the music and usually the uh, video saw was from Mitch Lauer from our men's club. He, he's fantastic and he did that. But Chad usually makes other videos to introduce us and they're just great. And he's done so many for the synagogue now. In fact, it's like a full-time job for him. So. And Chad, are you a professional videographer? Uh, no, I'm a retired radiologist. Uh, <laughs> Weird. So I have done, as the, as the uh, profession has changed, uh, I spent a lot of my day at a computer and on oh, monitors true. and so forth. So there was a little bit of crossover, but uh, most of that, the only thing that was created were the reports and the interpretations. I didn't really alter images. Outstanding, just outstanding. Well, you guys really... Uh... Were terrific. Everyone is texting me and putting com compliments. It was very, very. It was professionally done, and we've done many, many of these. I will give you some feedback. Uh, the best ones we've had are the cooking seminars where what you do, which is we don't go through the process. We watch the beginning, we talk about it, and then we see the end result, because this will now inspire all 90 people on board today to now learn from you. Everyone should have the recipes um, when they um, be able to make some scrumptious Pesach meals. Pesach is coming up in two and a half weeks. So it was one, we really wanted to do this for lots of reasons, but most importantly, because, because of Passover. So we can't thank you enough. This was just over the top outstanding. We will be doing more cooking webinars uh, and we would like to do a cooking webinar during our virtual uh, convention, which is June 6th to June 13th. So for those of you on the call that like to do this kind of thing, please contact me because I will be more than happy to talk to you about conducting a cooking affinity group webinar either uh, before this convention or during the convention or after the convention. So uh, great, great, great job. And it was nice to see that you're so enthusiastic about your men's club and about FJMC and that you got everyone involved. So it's a really, really enjoyable. Uh, so that's it. Does anyone have any questions?
I will put the link to the recipes one last time in the chat. And um, also in the chat, I did put a link to um, the cooking class at B'nai Asherin on uh, this Thursday, which will be um, totally different recipes. We're, uh, we're continuing on. So there will be no uh, repetition of anything you saw tonight. Right. We're using the good, we're using the good recipes on Thursday. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this was the trafe recipes. <laughs> We're using the, uh, I can't believe it's not Hamet's recipes. Okay. And also, uh, we have our recipes. I don't know if you can put it on. Tova compiled all our recipes during the year that could be used for Passover. Ah. I don't know if you can put a link for that. So here's the deal. Uh, first of all, someone just asked me, what shul are you from again? And where are you from? It's where it's B'nai Shurin. It's in Pepper Pike, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. Ah, okay. And, uh, and we, so uh, what, what I'm going to do is, synagogue. okay, so what I'm going to do is this is recorded, 95% of it. I, I, I forgot at the beginning as I was doing until someone reminds me, but that's good. Uh, I will post this soon uh, on the FJMC YouTube page, and then you guys can uh, watch it again and see all the things we're posting. Um, and if not, you can contact me or you can contact Murray and the team directly, and I'm sure they'll be happy to help you out. And uh, if anybody needs one of these, I have a few extra. <laughs> okay. So thank you again. Uh, thank you, Murray, Tova, Chad. Uh, a big, big thank you for uh, our FJMC International President, Tom Sudo, because this was his idea. He made this happen. Well, he made me make this happen, but he, he really uh, uh, knew about you, Murray, and he, and he has been saying to me for, for weeks now, just wait till you see this guy. This is over the top, and it certainly was. So uh, a little early in the year, but not that much, two and a half weeks to go. A happy Pesach. Hopefully this will be the last one where we have to do it by Zoom. Let's hope that next year we'll be able to have Sederim with our families, not in a box, but actually at a table. Um, and uh, that's around it. So thank you again, everyone. Uh, Murray and Toma, thank you very much. This was outstanding. Uh, and Danny, uh, I've only been eating Murray's food for 35 years. I don't know how Tom does it. He eats all these people's food and he's so thin. Look at Kravitz on me. We're like, you know. They're like, they know me when I wasn't so thin. <laughs> that's that's true, but uh, Tom's a heck of a guy, and I'm glad he's our president. And uh, you know, four more years or something. Four uh, more years. I'm coming back home. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you. Have a good Thanks. night. Thanks. Thanks again. Good night. Bye. Thanks. Bye.